everyone. Welcome to 30 Flirty and Nerdy. I'm Juliana and today I have Aaron Granati and I'm so excited because Aaron and I were in high school together. We did theater together and we were on lighting crew together, I believe. Weren't you a lighting manager? Yeah, uh, yes. I yes. think I was. Wow. I, you know what's <laughs> crazy? I didn't forget that we did that, but it's like I haven't heard that in a while to to spawn that memory so that's crazy that seems so long ago yet now that i'm thinking about it it's wow now i re- i remember that very vividly it's crazy and then it what's crazy too is that we didn't reconnect until your now wife andrea shout out to andrea hi it worked for my mom as a social media manager and we yeah. saw you again during first friday and we reconnected said hi like all of that which is really super cool Yeah, it's really a small world. And what's crazy is I don't even know. It it might have just been first Friday. I don't know how she how that even happened. And I don't even know if we I think we had just started dating. I think I I ran into your family again was first Friday. I made an introduction and then she started interning for her. So maybe that's how it happened. I think so. Or maybe there could have been something where there was an online ad and she saw it. I don't know. But that I don't what remember. You said makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really cool because you are a real estate agent. And I want to talk all about real estate with you because you've helped my sister with some of her properties. And sure. I don't have a property. I'm in an apartment right now. Okay. But I kind of want to talk with you about buying your first home, what it's like, what you should look out for. Because we're 30s now, you have your own home, you help other people find their homes. And for first home buyers, I don't know much about real estate. So I thought you'd be the perfect person to have on to talk about that. And yeah, kind of, absolutely. Yeah, answer some questions. So I want to get into you first. How did you go into real estate? What was it about it that you're like, this is what I want to do? Because you're amazing at it. So what was Oh, thank you. Of course. So what was your um, history like? Yeah, it was the it was the family business. It still is the family business. It was sometimes feels like I was always it was second nature because I was around it as like a child. My family had their own brokerage in New York and out in Long Island. So I was born in Long Island. When I was three or four years old, my family moved to las vegas they sold their brokerage and then basically that was it they moved here they set up shop here and then it was they never looked back my dad did commercial real estate my mom did residential real estate i think my mom's been licensed over 33 years 34 years or something like that i I think just in nevada alone so even before that she was licensed in new york so we're really talking like 40, 45 years worth of real estate in the family. I do always say this, I because a lot of people ask me, and now it's weird because we're getting older, right? I'm about to be, I'm going to be 31 in roughly a week or exactly in a week. And that's right. Our birthdays are close. Or I think yeah. it's the same day. Is it the 12th? Yeah. Yes, it's the same day. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's crazy. Yeah, we share a birthday. So yes. 12, 12, all the Sagittarius is out there. But yeah, I tell people all the time, because a lot of people have always ask me, how do I get into real estate? What do I do? Or they ask me that same question that you posed, what was my background in it or this or that. I always half jokingly say that I probably wouldn't have gotten into it if it wasn't for my family. And I tell people, I don't even know if I would do it. Like, I, There's a lot of aspects about it that I actually do not like. It's basically um, in your blood though. It's Yes, it was, it was in my blood. I grew up around it. I'd go from school to the office if they were working late. I it I was around it when listings weren't always online. I was around it where it truly was like who did what listings did that person have? You would call them up and they would fax it to you or send it to you. like they had the internet, but like my family was doing real estate where you really did advertise it. You put it in a magazine or you put it in the paper or you put it in like you would know it was truly networking back then because it was like, what listings did Juliana have or Aaron have? And we would communicate that way and send them to each other. It wasn't like we all go into a portal and search it that way. Now, do I think it's like extremely easy 
with technology? No, it's still, there's still a nuance to it and it's still a hard business. But before I was around it, when you had fax machines, you didn't have DocuSign, you didn't have, there was so many more moving pieces to it. So I watched it really transform from the pager. Like my dad, my mom used to have a pager and that you would get a sign call. It would be a page. And it was like someone paged you in and you would call them back, it just page you and they knew it came from that listing because you would put a sign on your listing and then it would have the pager number. So that's really how long it goes back for me. And I don't know if I would have gotten into it hadn't been from the family. I got my license my junior year of college. I went to UNLV. I was working on the strip. So I was in hotel operations on the strip. I worked at the Cosmopolitan. I opened the Cosmopolitan which was a really cool experience. I learned a lot there. I learned a lot about business there. I learned a lot about how the corporate structure is from there. And I took a lot of what I learned there and applied it to my own business and how I carry myself and whatnot. That's so cool. So you had the experience from your family like during page, the pager times, which is wild to think. And then you did, like you said, you helped open the Cosmopolitan, which is really super cool too. So it's really cool that you used everything from your life to get to where you are now. Yes, I would say I'm extremely fortunate in that sense that I had mentorship. I had all of those things regarding real estate. I I think real estate, though, too, for me, this is my experience of it. Can anyone go and do it? Sure. But the people that there's kind of two ways around it. And I'm on the second piece of what I'll share. The first piece of real estate is... You just go and get your license, you get your license, pass the test, you got your license, you can buy and sell real estate in the state of Nevada. And there's a lot of people who are very good at making a ton of phone calls. They're very good at advertising. They're very good at maybe marketing and they do a ton of hustling and a lot of legwork and it's very salesy and they're very numbers oriented. They look at real estate through that lens. I need to make this many calls to have this many leads, to have a conversion rate of what they can sell. And that's great. And I think there's a part of real estate that you have to do some of that if you want to sustain in real estate. The other part of real estate, and this is where I think I more align with, is I'm not flashy as I could be. I don't constantly sell a lifestyle that's not real, or I'm not renting fake expensive cars and having these marketing videos and showing a lavish lifestyle that is not really there. I've never advertised myself as the number one agent or a top producer, even though my numbers probably say that I am, or I fall in the upper 15% or 20% of agents. So I fall into that category where I am passionate about it. I am good at it. I like it but I'm not fake about it. I don't treat people like a number. I don't do like in real estate, you will get a client and then you can pass it on to an admin if you wanted to. You could teach, you could pay someone to just do the paperwork. You don't even have to do the paperwork anymore. You just, it could just be all focused on numbers of names and like trying to get as many contacts as possible. And then if you developed a system, you would just funnel that person through that system. But I'm not like that. I've, I was brought up in it where it wasn't like that. It was more person to person and peer to peer and referral based and referral minded and repeat business was the goal. And it wasn't like, how much money can I make tomorrow versus sustainable money over time by providing good service, fair service, honest service, all of those things. Right. And so That's why I say, I don't know if I'd be in it because there's a lot that I know about it that I actually dislike. And there's a lot of people in the industry that it's hard. It's hard working with a lot of these other people sometimes in the business because they don't have that same mind. You have to remember that there's 20,000 real estate agents, which that's roughly what it is in Las Vegas. There's roughly 20,000 agents, mostly part-time, a lot of part-time agents in Las Vegas. But those agents, everyone is is their own business. Everyone is totally their own business. Everyone runs their business differently. Now there's a general, yeah, there's a general consensus of like how certain things go, how a transaction goes, but you could call up 10 people. You're going to get 10 different ways in which they carry themselves. It's not go to, even amongst brokerages, you could go to 10 different agents in the same brokerage and they're different. 
So it's a fascinating business for sure. Yeah, that's really interesting because like you said, you're. I feel like you're way more people oriented than number oriented, like you mentioned. And it, I definitely feel like it's because of your upbringing from your family, like seeing them do everything, like what you said. So it's really interesting hearing that there's so many different agents and brokerages and each one of them does something different and each one of them has their own business. And it's, I thought that real estate agents are part of one big, like one big company. And then there's a sect under them, kind of like an MLM yeah. in a way. Yeah, it could be, I suppose. Some brokerages might be that way. Yeah. Most familiar to that model might be like a Keller Williams, where it's like a very big box, very corporate you have a okay. team leader and then you have people under you and then you have agents that are only a buyer's agent or only a listing agent. Mm -hmm. And then there's the splits involved. And that's a whole, we could do a whole other episode. Like yeah. Just on that so one. what is it that you don't like about real estate? Because I want to know about that too. What is okay. like the um, things you don't like at all? You get used to it. So I don't even, I'm just going to say what I think people probably wouldn't like about it. I don't like these things, but it's like a fact of the business, if that makes sense. You don't have a choice. Yes. What I'm going to say is this is how it is. There's no, there's not like that's the business right. is what real estate is. Okay. One thing I don't like about real estate, compare it, comparing it to another profession, perhaps we'll use law. Okay. Law is probably a good parallel to stuff that goes on in real estate. In real, here's one thing I don't like about real estate that I think other people will also not like or wouldn't like. You can do a lot of work. You can spend a lot of energy. You can spend a lot of time. And with a client or even without a client, you can de devote energy and time into real estate and you will see absolutely no money from it at all. Whereas even in something you didn't like, another business or a job or whatever, if you committed to the 10 hours or the 40 hours in the week, or whatever it was, you still would see compensation from your efforts. In real estate, it is truly one of those things where you could be completely right and you get no compensation from it, no money. And technology is, has hurt that, I think, a little bit. Whereas before, like I mentioned, it was like truly the agent really mattered because people couldn't just Zillow something or just look up something like information is more readily out there that removes, it makes it easier for someone to not need an agent involved per se. But I just think you could do a ton of effort, a lot of work, be totally right. Your client, it's nothing you did wrong with your client or anything. And just for whatever reason, the transaction doesn't happen and you don't get paid for that. So you just, you live and die by the sword, so to speak. So that's one thing I don't like. And I was going to say with law as a parallel, law, lawyers lose all the time. They're still paid. They still got paid. They still filed all the work. They did everything that you asked them to do. And you, consumer, still pays the lawyer for the service. So do you get paid then when everything's finalized? Is that when you get paid? So, so yeah, someone... in, in a real estate transaction, pretty much someone only compensation will only occur when a transaction closes. And then even then, this is super rare. Even then it could be disputed. So there's actually rules. And that's when you get really deep into the contract where a transaction could happen. And then if something happened throughout the transaction or very soon after the transaction, if someone wants to hold up the payment, they could. And then you, there would be a dispute potentially about who gets paid or not. Yeah, no, there's a lot of moving pieces to it in terms of just being compensated. I didn't really get into it for the big bucks though, or making a lot of money. And I think a lot of people, look how we got on the subject of it. It's not, it's like, we just did to start talking about the money aspect of it, but I didn't even get into it because of that. Left the strip only because I felt where I was in a place in my life and my career where I felt if I worked this many hours, what if I did do it for myself? And what if I made the same living, but it was for myself and I got to make my own schedule and I got to have my own hours and it would be really cool to just have my own life, so to speak, mostly schedule and 
make the same money. So it wasn't like making more money or, oh my God, I can't wait to have a nice car. Or do, you know, it was like none of those thoughts it was strictly like, hey, I'm going to like really help people. I enjoy helping people. I was working in hotel operations and that was like very customer service oriented and helping the guests and a guest experience and all of these things, right? So I had that mindset when I transitioned into real estate full-time. I really truly didn't think of it. Oh, if I make this many calls and I get this many escrows, I make this much money and that's it. I didn't look at it like that. More the of the beginning. lifestyle. It was more the lifestyle. It was more the lifestyle that you wanted. Do yeah. your own hours. Yeah, it was my own strict. hours. I do being my own boss. It is scary mm -hmm. though, because you truly don't know. Okay, here's another thing. You said, what don't I like about real estate? I literally do not know the next time I do get paid either. So again, it's like you literally truly a business where could be Tuesday, it could be a Friday, it could be a month, could be two weeks, could be three months. Don't know. The longest I've gone is probably like three months, three or four months. That's a long time. Yeah, I think people... That's crazy. I think our generation is used to having some hustle and having side gigs. And especially in Las Vegas, it's a very cash-friendly city. If you hustle, you can just make some money. No, I, I'm used to like, I don't know when. Yeah. So it's one thing I don't like about it. Like it's, and again, it's not like the quantity of money. So that's not mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at. I hope no one takes it that way. It's truly more, I'm just saying like the logistics. Right. I think most people make on average 50 to a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say you still made that amount of money, but I'm going to not tell you literally whenever you get paid, you know, you're going to make $50,000 for the year, but literally you don't know how you're gonna that make is so hard that's cool right so yeah. that, that's that's one thing i don't like about real estate all right now we since we talked about what you don't like about real estate how you got into real estate what does the vegas market look like now and is it worth buying something at this time that's a great question the market is extremely different than it has been in i want to say the last four years the last two years, especially, we know that nothing, no industry is was really completely untouched by COVID. COVID and what the Fed did really exacerbated what was going on in the real estate market. So the real estate market was already very... I'm speaking just in Vegas. There's national trends, but I'm going to speak just for Southern Nevada. The market was already very good here in 2019. And I think for many years here... You could have a regular salary, you could work on the strip, you could you get your credit in order, you get a down payment, you have it here. And I'll touch on one of your questions I know you wanted to get to was like a first time home buyer. What do you need to do? So I'll touch on a little bit of that. You to qualify for a mortgage, you need two year tax returns, you need a down payment. A lot of people think 20%. You don't have to have 20%. You can have as little as three and a half percent down of the purchase price. The payment's obviously going to be a lot higher, but so you could have as little as three and a half percent down. I think on average, I see five percent, five to ten percent conventional. You have a FHA loan, which means simply means the money it's backed by the federal government, federal housing administration. That's all that means. A lot of people get hung up on on that FHA or conventional, and then conventional simply just means it's from a bank, like a regional bank, and the money was originated from the bank. So you go to a bank and you say, hey, I want to buy a house. And they go, okay, great. You need all this information. It's called a pre-approval process, right? They pre-approve you to go buy the home. And you get qualified that way. And then you would start the process with a realtor and go shopping and all those things. But that'd be the first bullet point steps. But your initial question. So that process I just said, that's been the process for many years. And so now I know why I went off on that little side road. So that whole process up until 2020, 2021, that's the process. What happened in 2020 and 2021, it was like you would do all of that. And because they lowered interest rates, it made your, everyone's purchasing power so much higher. So you go do that process. You saved up your down payment. You have good credit. You have a job you've been at for a while. And... You want to buy a house because the interest rates were like low 3%. If someone previously could afford 
a $300,000 home or a $250,000 home or a $300,000 home in Las Vegas. Now they could afford $365,000 or maybe $400,000. And this kind of reverberated through the whole like market. If you could buy seven, now you could buy 780, 800,000. Like everybody moved up 100, 150,000 in purchasing power because of how rates were. And this happened nationally, but in Vegas, you have to remember there's no ocean here. Pricing here was recovering and had recovered from our last big recession. So there was a lot of homes available if you could break a certain price point. So if like you were stuck at 350, maybe there's X amount of homes. Now you qualify for 400. There was way more homes at 400. So you had this frenzy and this big tidal wave happen in 2020 and 2021 and about half of this year. And not only was it crazy, it was really not sustainable. You had people paying over the appraisal, so when you go to get a loan, most deals are financed. You could buy a house cash, right? That's part of real estate. But most homes are financed, just like most cars are financed. You put a down payment and you finance the balance. With real estate, with mortgages, it's the same thing. So we, the bank has to get an appraisal. So the bank's going to order an appraisal to make sure what they're loaning you on is quote unquote worth the price that you agreed to pay, okay? If it's not, they'll only loan you on what the appraisal value is. So if you're in the contract for 400, the appraisal comes in at 390, they'll give you a loan based on 390, but you agreed to pay the other person 400. So there's a $10,000 discrepancy. So what was going on the last couple of years is people to get the house because they wanted the house so bad they would still have their down payment and they'd pay their down payment based on 390. And then they would pay an additional $10,000 on top of it to make the deal whole at 400. So that went on for the last two years. That, that could happen before too. It's not like that never happened. And that's previously. not a good thing. That was not a good thing for it to happen. For the seller doesn't care. And the seller is like extremely happy. And that's where you heard of like, bidding wars and okay. people making all this money and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And oh, it's a seller's market. Yeah, because you're selling something. You can keep it at a basic level. It's complicated because it's a, such a large purchase, purchase and it's a house. But imagine if we were selling anything. We were selling soda, okay? We're selling Coca-Cola. And you agreed to give me a dollar a can, but you have to get a loan for it. And they're like, really? It's only worth 75 cents but you're going to give me another quarter just because, just because you want the soda that I have. That's if, how crazy it is. If I make it simple and you think of it like that, you're like, man, that's so dumb. Like, why would I do that? But that's even, I'm trying to wrap my head around this because like- I know, I sorry, I'm you, unpacking like a lot. I know. This is giving why you I a lot, of, on lot here. to think about. <laughs> this is why I wanted you on here because I didn't know any of this stuff about real estate. So it's really interesting to me. So it's like people are just putting down extra money, even though they already- have the house they would just it really it, hurts the it's like a Walmart. psychological it's like a psychological thing right because they want to feel like they have the house they have everything good they don't want to lose it so they put more down and right and finally think of it from an emotional standpoint too not just like a market standpoint you finally right. found a house that you really liked you want to make this offer on the house to buy the house and while you're doing the loan process because it's in stages to buy a house takes about 30 days give or take in Las Vegas. That's pretty quick. Other markets, it can take longer, the fastest. And if you work with my lender, we could do it in about 21 days to 25 days. But on average, you plan about a month from having an accepted contract. So when you go to buy a house, if you get your contract accepted, your offer accepted, it's going to take about 30 days for you to get keys. Okay. They so that, down that extra appraisal money. and all that process I talked about, that will happen during those 30 days. Okay. And so they would still put down extra money after everything is finalized? So to finalize the deal, here's mm -hmm. here, I'm going to, I'll just bullet point really quick the process. Yes, you <laughs> get a pre-approval. You're going to start looking at homes. That's the my favorite part, the shopping. 
you find houses that you like or a house, a singular house. You'll submit an offer. Let's assume your offer gets accepted. Your offer gets accepted. You get an inspection. You get X amount of days to do an inspection. After the inspection, you're going to have an appraisal from the bank. The bank, the lender will order an appraisal. It's a third party company will come in. It's an appraisal company comes in, gets an appraisal of the house. It takes 30 minutes. It's really easy. They come in, they take some pictures. Then a couple of days later, they'll submit a report named an appraisal and say, hey, we think it's this much money and here's why. And at that point, you'll be finalizing your loan. There's a bunch of loan documents you'd be getting. There's all of this is intertwined with what's called an escrow or a title company. So the title company is passing the title from the seller to you, the new buyer. And that during that whole process, that's where the appraisal would come into play. And so you would know your balance of your down payment, like what you already thought you were going to spend. So if it was a hundred thousand dollar purchase, you were putting 5% down, that's five grand, right? So you had an appraisal in there. If it didn't appraise for a hundred thousand, you would do 5% of whatever it appraised at, which is 90,000. And then if the seller didn't want to come down and you couldn't agree to a new price to finalize the deal, you would have your down payment plus the difference. And that's what people were doing. That's what, and it was like, wasn't like a small amount of money. It was like, people would do this with 30 grand, 25 grand, just cash. And so I don't, I hope you can follow me here and I hope people listening can follow this part of it. Why that is bad is because it's not going against your loan. That's the most important piece of this. It's you're paying over the appraisal and it's just like you handed the seller that money and it's gone. So I'm going to use round numbers. You bought a house for $100,000. You put down $5,000. You owe the bank $95,000 with me. Okay. If the appraisal was low, you would only do 5% of, I'll do it really quick for you. Let's say Thank you. I'm 5, terrible at math. <laughs> $95,000 at 5% is $4,750. So you're going to owe on your loan, you're going to owe $90,250. But to complete the sale, you had to pay another five thousand. You with me? You still only so. you spent ten thousand dollars, or fifteen thousand in this example, whatever it was. But you don't owe eighty five thousand dollars. You still owe ninety thousand. So you just spent that extra money is just gone. I think you understand a little bit. How I'm I think it. so. I'm trying to. I'm really bad at math, so I'm trying to it's understand. Okay. But yeah, that was going on. But so that's, it just was. Sorry, I was just gonna say it just was like, like them being sneaky, trying to earn more extra money. No, it just was a fact. It was the market was that difficult. There was that much demand. Oh. I'll simplify it again. Let's say. <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'm just. I'm trying to understand it. It's just, I know it's a lot. It's not like in my wheelhouse. I'm like, wait. It's like. I know because nothing, when you buy something else in the world, it's so easy. It's so much easier. A pair of jeans, you walk into a store, they have jeans on the rack. You try the jeans on. There's a tag that says $100, $99. You walk to the register and it's a very, it's archaic system, right? It's a barter system. I give you $100. You give me the jeans. With real estate and land and the government, it's so it's so much deeper than that. Just, oh, here's this much money. You hand me the house that I think that's why it's sounding complicated. But there was, I'll try to simplify it. If you had a apple, okay? And there's one apple and someone walks into a town square and says, hey, everyone, I have an apple. I'll sell it for a dollar. And 20 people show up and they go, I'll give you a dollar. There's 20 people that will all pay a dollar. The way America works, it's, to my knowledge, this would be a, in all 50 states. This is how real estate would work. It's whatever they agree to. 
So as the seller, it's a capitalistic country that we live in. Why would the seller only take a dollar for that apple? So it's the same thing with a house. You, Someone says, hey, I'll take 300,000 for my house. And you put that out to the world. 20 people showed up and said, yeah, I'll give you 300. How do you decide who gets the house? And you got a lot of laws too. There's fair housing. There's all these rules, right? Which are good. There used to be discrimination against, in Nevada, actually, one of the last states to definitively outlaw this. And I was really happy when they did this is homosexuality was not pr protected in Nevada. You actually, legal, I mean, obviously it doesn't happen often, but legally there was no protection. So you could say as a homeowner that was selling, two people came to the house and the seller happened to see them or knew from common information that, oh, hey, it was two men or it was two women or something. I don't want to sell to them. Legally, they didn't have to. So now there's a bunch of rules and stuff now that they would ha they have to fair housing. You can't discriminate against that to to sell. But back to the That's Apple crazy. in the town square example. In terms of money, though, America is still America. Where if there's 20 people and all 20 people, all things equal, say they want to give you 300 thousand, you don't have to take it. You can take whatever you want. The market will provide. It's a free market. So the market was so crazy. The last two years, you had people just fighting over, bidding over uh, the same house. So it made it extraordinarily difficult for first-time home buyers. It put a strain on sales. It was a very difficult market. If you were good, sales were amazing. Like I've been in real estate. I've been working. Like I was able to capitalize on how hot the market was. But if you were brand new to the market, it was really hard to navigate. And I think a lot of new agents probably struggled. Or the reverse, it was such a good market that they crushed it. And now that the market has changed, now they're going to be struggling. And so I think mm -hmm. there's some of that too. So what would you say has been, this isn't a question that I, that I was thinking about asking, it just popped in my head. What would you say has been the most over asking price of a house that you ended up closing on? So say a house was like me or that I saw for you, like personally, what was like the highest that you've ever had so far in your career? That was like over asking price. Does that makes sense. Thirty-five, forty thousand dollars So we started at okay. 340,000. The house ended up selling at 380, 385. That's pretty good. Cool. That's awesome that happened. Yeah. Awesome for the seller. Again, the buyer, it's wow, that's crazy that someone would do that. But if you have it, I'm a believer in that. Like, I don't feel bad for a buyer that did that. I feel bad for all the normal, in, in quotes, people who just wanted it to be fair. And it sucks that housing is part of a capitalistic market sort of thing where you can do everything right. And then geez, you only have just your down payment. That's really not good enough. Or it wasn't. Right now, it's fine. Today, to answer your original question that we, I gave a very lengthy answer to, the market has significantly softened and is a lot better than it has been for buyers right now. And that is because interest rates are literally double what they were or about two and a half times what they were. So payments are a lot higher. Purchasing power is now a lot lower. So if you remember me saying that, it was like, you only qualify for a certain amount of house. The price now pricing has been driven up. So we're in a weird place. Purchasing power of people is lower just by default. It's if you just do the math, it's not like you don't want a nice, nicer house or something. It's like, you just can't afford it. It's like the budget's not there. It does, the math doesn't work. So right now there's low purchasing power. Pricing is high. Because sellers, the way pricing works is they look at, hey, what other apples, how much do these other apples sell for around me? So it's the same with houses, right? What did all these other houses that are like mine sell for? And that's where the people come up with price. So it's a tricky market. It's really interesting. You look at what sold, how long did it take for it to sell? Is it comparable to your property, the square feet, the bedrooms, how it physically looks, the condition, all of those things. So right now the market is significantly better to purchase. So that leads into my next question. For a first time 
single person like me, if I wanted to buy a home, what would you suggest I buy a condo or an actual house? What would be the best I, I would buy budget. within your budget. Yeah. If you're going to commit to a city and this advice, I think works for any city. I would just look at the budget and the math. And then you decide if you can live in what that gives you mm-hmm. and not to overthink it. I think all of us have really high aspirations and high wants and Netflix has come in and HGTV has come in and yep. we've really pop culture the hell out of real estate and we've made it look really sexy and really fun. But the truth is all of that is fake to an extent. I mean, it's real for somebody, but for the majority of people, it'll never be what we see on TV or, or, you know, like selling sunset, (laughs) all the lifestyle of it. Right. Yeah. Here, I'll some quick math for you and let's just, we'll use, 5% because I think that's really obtainable or it should be if you really think you ever did want to buy a home and we'll go what I think a payment is reasonable. If you're single, I think you're still going to think this is a really expensive payment, but I just think this is, I mean, this is what it is to be in Vegas. Now I have friends that are in one bedroom apartments that they tell me they're paying 17, 1800 a month. I know one friend, he's in really nice apartment and he got his renewal for two grand. So I'm just going to look at if you ha- had a $2,000 payment or like a $2,100 payment and you're, let's do 10% down. So yeah, $2,100 payment. Okay. This is rough numbers. At today's interest rates, you could buy a house. So a $300,000 house, 10% down is $30,000. You're going to have some closing costs. Closing costs is like an all-encompassing term of a lot of things but for this example we'll just say seven to eight thousand dollars so roughly i would tell you to budget for thirty eight thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars would be good plenty of money then plenty of money to buy the house and you're gonna spend this forty thousand dollars on a three hundred thousand dollar condo townhome house whatever and your payment with everything, principal, which is what you owe, interest, okay, on the loan, taxes, you got taxes, state taxes, and then you have insurance. If the house burns down, you have to have insurance, right? And I'm going to use an HOA, which is a homeowners association. Most places in Las Vegas have a homeowners association. In that example, you're looking at $2,134 a month. So, that would be what I budget, like $38,000, $40,000. And that would be able to buy you a three. In today's interest rates at 6.5%, I'll do six and a quarter. So yeah, 2100 a month. That's $300,000 is the payment. So if you're like, okay, my budget's $2,100. I know that I can buy anything that's $300,000 or less. And that's how I would okay. look at it. And then you go and look into the market and be like, what is $300,000 get me? And you're pretty right. In Vegas, that doesn't get you a house anymore. It can. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Then that's where you get into the location and the area. And does it suit your needs? How big is it? You could have a really, you could have a bigger condo in a nicer area, or you could have a, a nicer area is subjective, but a more sought after area. And that's how I would go about doing it if I was a first time home buyer. But the sooner you start the process, the math starts working in your favor. So a famous saying is, don't wait to invest in real estate, invest in real estate and then wait. Because the long, if you're just not in real estate, if you forget your parents, you just said a single person, like a human being on earth, that human being has to have shelter or you would want shelter. So you're going to be paying for shelter for your whole life. So the sooner you own something, the math starts working in your favor that you'd be paying it down. And historically, real estate is worth more in the future. Even if it's not worth more in the future, the math would still start working for you because it's going to force you to save. By default, you're paying down the loan 
And if the value just stays the same, you're going to owe less. And then in the future, you want something bigger. You turned your 30000 or $35,000, maybe you turn it into 60000 over time. So that's what I would, I, that's what I would say is, you know, make it a goal, focus on the goal, have a down payment. You have to be employed. You have to have two years tax returns. You have to have consistent employment and anyone can be a homeowner. That is so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your real estate journey, all the information. I'm still wrapping my head around everything. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot. You, Sorry. Yeah. No, it's good. Like you, you really know your stuff, which is why I'm really happy you're on here. Sure. And so I hope people listen to it. I hope someone who yeah. listens, sits down and listens to it, it they're, they take away something from what I've said, what I said. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy, but it's, it's rewarding. It can be financially rewarding. I think it's different than a car. It's a car will unfortunately depreciate over time. I don't think homes depreciate. I think we, they are going down right now a little bit in the market. Like I said, it's softer. There's less demand. So there's less demand. Pricing's got to come down. If someone really has to sell. If you keep dropping the price, eventually it'll sell. And yeah, it's just, I'm definitely going to be listening back to this myself just so I can <laughs> process it all again. I'm like, okay, yeah, what you said was really good. And like get really situated into owning my own place in the future because yeah, I, I, I would tell you to start with the budget. It makes it a okay. lot easier. Everyone goes on Zillow and everyone watches yeah. Netflix and everyone, and they're like, oh my God, like I want that, whatever that yeah. is. But the truth is buy within your means. You don't want to be house poor. It's a true term. House poor is you spend all your money on getting a really nice place. And then you just are struggling every month to pay that payment. And you don't really have furniture and you don't really, no one thinks about like you have utilities, you're going to still need to buy food. You're still going to want to buy furniture. It's a lot that goes into it. So I would pick a budget and buy around the budget. Really good advice. And speaking of good advice, <laughs> the best question that I like to ask anyone that's on the podcast is what advice do you wish you had before turning 30? And as we mentioned earlier, we have the same birthday. So what advice do you wish that you had before this time last year? <laughs> oh, man. Wow. What advice do I have for like past me? Yes. Yeah, so say someone that's listening to this podcast and they're like, 28, 29, they're nervous about becoming 30. What advice? Oh, they're nervous just about becoming 30? Or is it like someone who's yeah. 21? I don't really know if 21-year-olds are listening to a 30-year-old podcast. Sure. But if I'm usually I ask this question because I imagine 26-year-olds to 38, 39-year-olds listening to the podcast. Okay. And I like to ask this question because inching to the, my 30s, I was so like, nervous about them i'm like i haven't succeeded anything in a while i haven't done anything i wanted to do i feel so out of place i, I like i just felt very i think a lot of people unsure, are going through you know? that i'm gonna pull a pull not a quote but the concept from gary v perhaps is that 30 is still really young in most instances we see someone else do something before us so then it's like you feel behind and it could just be one person. So it's like, no matter how many examples of someone not accomplishing something where it's like, hey, that's actually normal is that you didn't accomplish that because one person did and you saw the one person. It's like we get fixated on that. I'll give an example with dating. Uh, I recently got married. So I have friends that are single or they thought they were going to marry someone because we're getting to that age, right? Where like everyone is married and has a kid. We say it just like that. Oh man, everyone's getting married and have a kid. Maybe they are, but I would bet almost anything that there's actually equally as many people not, or it's not as, it's like not everyone, like everyone means it's 90%, nine, nine out of 10. I doubt it's nine out of, I guarantee it's not, oh, nine out of 10 is married at 30. I guarantee you it's not. So it's the same thing. That's probably that 
number one advice that I'd give to someone turning 30 that's afraid. Like I've accomplished a lot. For me, they were goals that I set. They were goals that I stuck with. I had a lot of help. I don't want to say it was just me. I did have help. I took heed to the advice that I was given and acted on that advice in a big way through through years of practice and thinking about what I wanted. So that's my journey and my story, but that's me. That doesn't, it's not like a right or a wrong. So I think people are hard on themselves turning 30. I don't feel younger. That's for sure. I definitely like 30 hit and I'm like, dang, like this is crazy. Like, it, Your I, knees start hurting. My and... knees definitely started hurting oh, at 30. Same. <laughs> um, I have a thyroid disorder <laughs> that I'm came sorry. up in during 2020. Yeah, I have Graves oh, disease. Man. So that was interesting. So yeah, I have like life stuff that happened to me. But no, I think 30s, I wouldn't sweat it. 30s great. I don't know. Yeah. I'm in the I'm in a really happy spot, like from that perspective. Right. I love being 30. I don't think I'd change anything about my journey, but I think what you were hinting at or getting at is people are like, man, I'm 30 and I still didn't do X, Y, Z. And it's okay. A lot of people didn't like, what is the barometer? And I think that's Gary V touches a lot on that. He's you're yeah. still young. He's I didn't do anything. I was still selling bag and wine when I was 30. He's I didn't make it or had money or had a media agency until I was 40 or whatever. But he, his whole point is it's that's his journey. But for someone else, it happens sooner. For someone else, it happens later. But I think the realest thing that I see and know for sure is definitely the dating thing or the house buying thing or any of these big life things. And I think because we have social media and social media is, is it's like a magnifying glass. We, it's like celebrity. You, you're like following one person and you're like, what'd that one person do? You get fixated on what they did. And it's, that's not everyone. So everyone's chasing something that may not be obtainable for them. So that's my advice is try to figure out, like, if you want something, then go get it and then take action. Don't like be like, well, I, ugh, I'm 30. I, I don't know. I would just like, not think about it and just act upon. There's a roadmap. There's nothing that we, we, haven't talked about or anything that you could ask me that I'd be like, hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. It's been done. Someone's like, man, I really want to get married. What are you doing to accomplish that? Are you dating a lot? Are you having good dates? Are you like meeting the right people for that? Put yourself out there. But I'm really yeah. shy. I'm this and that. Okay. Why don't you work on being shy? There's guidance for each thing. It's not like you're the first person to be shy or whatever, right? Or, or buying a house. Damn, I don't have a down payment. Okay, save a down payment. I don't make a lot of money. Okay, how much can you save? Oh, I can only save $100. Okay, start saving that 100. That's 1200 a month, 100 a month, 1200 a year. It take you 10 years to get just over 10 grand. That's it's that's what it would be then. I don't know. You have to figure it out. Try to make then I need more money so I can save more. Okay, what else can you do to make more money? We could just go down the list. Solvable. Anything that's that's a problem. It's okay. We could sit here and figure out how to solve it. Yeah, so I think us 30 year olds, though, I, we want it right now. Our generation is like, how do I do it today? Yeah, so. it's true. We have everything so quick and accessible that I think sometimes we forget that we have to put in work to achieve what we really want. And it doesn't necessarily have to be work, but it's truly is about patience and timing. And a lot of things have to go right. A yeah. lot of things are not in your control. So as soon as you let go of that as well, it's a balance. And I struggle Very with true. it too. It's a learning process. And we're like you said, we're still young. We still have a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. And people's lives change every day. Someone who's a first time home buyer and they're like, this is what I'm doing. And maybe you meet someone and that person has a home. And then all of a sudden now you're living in that house. And then maybe yeah. you marry that person. And then now you're... Now you have a house because that person had a house. There's so many <laughs> possibilities. Like life is interesting, but no, there's a lot to it. Yeah. Thank you so much for being a guest and sharing your time with me today and just getting into the nitty gritty of real estate and 
the advice I asked about 30 and everything like that. I truly appreciate you being on here. So thank you. No, thanks for having me. It was awesome. I hope can't wait to listen back myself and maybe pick up on things I said, or it's always good. I try to provide clear. I hope what I said was clear and makes sense. And there's something to take from it. Oh, definitely. I took a lot from it. I'm still processing everything. And I'm definitely going to be thinking about it all night because it's seemed to me and it's okay. So this is what I have to do. I have to start saving now. Yeah. Really, or I mean, really you cool. could family can help. I mean, it, it's I just because you said a single person back to the real estate stuff said, what does a single person do that's just on their own? That's like, I want like, if the goal was I want to buy a house, then yeah, that's savings. Yeah. The top thing. Saving and increasing your income as well. But it's truly not about what you make. It's about what you keep. But like on that. both, but on both sides of the spectrum, like if you can increase your income, but also live within your means and save mm -hmm. faster, you do that, the faster you can change your finances for sure. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Hey friends, thank you for listening to today's episode. Please take a moment to follow and review this podcast so it can reach others. Also, if you leave a review, I'll be sharing your review in the next episode. Lastly, if you want to be part of this growing podcast to chat about your life, your profession, passions, or if you have advice that you wish you had at 30, please sign up at the link provided in the show notes. I would love to have you as a guest on the show. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.